Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, the title of the talk was deliberately vague to try to uh, be, uh, to draw in a big audience. Uh, it also allowed me to sort of put more thought into what I wanted to say um, by being a little bit ambiguous at the beginning. But what I'm going to talk about is the result of about a decade of work of my students, postdocs, and myself uh, developing an approach to theory of complex systems. And in particular, complex systems theory that's built on a foundation of information theory, and in particular, a foundation of application of the maximum information entropy principle. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry, because I'm gonna go in to explain it in detail. Let me begin with just a little bit of physics, actually. Uh, uh, if we look at the role that big data has played in the past, and I put big in quotation marks here because by today's standards, it was pretty measly. But it's interesting to think about the role that data has played in developing scientific theory. Um, if we look at the history of our understanding of uh, Newtonian physics, uh, in a way, the beginning was a technological advance, the invention of the telescope by Galileo and others. Uh, the telescope allowed Tycho Brahe to accumulate lots and lots of data. Uh, he didn't know what to do with it, but he filled notebooks with data on the locations and, uh, of the planets over a long period of time. Johannes Kepler took Brahe's data and saw patterns didn't know how to explain them, but was able to see that there were patterns in the solar system. And then Newton, of course, explained the patterns with his theory of gravity. Another example of this begins with technology again. Instead of the telescope, the steam engine, James Watt. Um, that led Joule and Clausius and others to discover uh, beautiful thermodynamic relationships and then eventually along came Boltzmann, and I should put Gibbs on that as well, who developed the uh, modern theory of statistical mechanics. Um, today, we have really big data, and I'm illustrating this with supercomputers. We have satellites. We have algorithms in artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, chess programs that can beat any grandmaster. And so you might ask, who needs Boltzmann? We can just use the data and figure out what it means and draw conclusions without um, having to mess around with theory. Well, I strongly object to that viewpoint, and I'm going to try to convince you that it's a wrong way to think about the future of science. Um, in a way, there are two very different ways to construct theory. A theory of complex systems. And I call them the bottom-up and the top-down approach. The bottom-up is illustrated by what uh, Newton did. Um, basically, what he did is go from properties of things at small scale to macro scale, to look at large-scale phenomena as the consequence of the interactions of things um, that comprise the system. In general, what one does is make mechanistic models in which we take um, some understanding of the mechanisms governing the players at the micro scale. The, um, for example, in economics, the consumers of goods. In linguistics, the speakers of languages. Incomes of people, sizes of organisms, uh, the uh, uh, speeds of molecules the nodes in a network, et cetera, and extend with mechanistic modeling up to the macro scale to derive system level properties. An alternative approach illustrated by, especially by Boltzmann and Gibbs's work, is to start at the macro scale and derive probability distributions at the micro scale. A beautiful example is, of course, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of the speeds of molecules. Starting with 
macro scale information, which I call state variables. In the case of thermodynamics, pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas, one can derive the distribution of the molecular speeds, the famous Boltzmann distribution. So one is going from macro properties down to the probability distributions at the micro scale. And it's that approach which I want to argue is very powerful and probably best suited for understanding complex ecosystems. But suppose we decide we're going to do the bottom-up approach, and we're going to try to understand patterns in ecology, patterns like uh, distributions of abundances of the species, or the relationship between the number of species we see in a census and the area of the habitat that we censused, the so-called species area relationship. If we try to derive these things from the bottom up, we would of course start with the mechanisms that govern the interactions of the players at the micro scale. And in ecology, the players at the micro scale are the individual organisms. And how do they interact? Well, there's predation, mutualism, competition, dispersal, speciation, birth, death, pollination. I won't read the whole list. It goes on and on and on. And I've only given a subset of all the potential mechanisms that we know operate in ecosystems. And every one of those mechanisms has been um, singled out and uh, exploited to try to understand some patterns. But in fact, in most ecosystems, most, if, if not all, of those mechanisms can be operative. Um, in addition, these mechanisms operate uh, within stochastic environments. They're subject to historical contingency, ambiguous system boundaries, and difficulty conducting controlled experiments to tease apart the actual functional uh, properties of those mechanisms. How do we write expressions that incorporate the mechanism? Well, we usually just write down simple functions and have uh, parameters in the model, and then we fit the parameters to some behavior. But given the number of mechanisms and the ambiguity about how those mechanisms operate in nature, this looks like a pretty difficult approach. And I'm going to show you an alternative. Um, the reason we think we should persist and look for theory in ecology is that there are pervasive patterns in ecology. Patterns that suggest, in Darwin's famous phrase, there are indeed laws acting around us. Um, lots of species have few individuals. A few species have many individuals. That's an interesting pattern. Metabolic rates of individuals vary inversely, generally, with the abundance of the species that the individual is in. That's interesting. Many genera and families have only a few species, but a few genera and families have lots of species. A few species eat many things. Many species eat only a few things. Those are just some of qualitative generalizations we can make when we look at lots and lots of ecosystems. And interestingly, rather accurate mathematical formulas, functions, are now known to describe these properties. They're not just word statements. We can actually write functions that do a good job fitting the patterns that I've described. In a sense, this is the Kepler phase of ecology. Kepler, remember, found the patterns from the data. And we see the patterns in the data. And the question is, where are they coming from? And what I want to suggest is that a powerful way to understand quantitatively what those patterns look like is to make use of something called the maximum entropy principle. Now, the basic idea is that for um, we start with prior knowledge about a system. The system could be a thermodynamic system, an ecosystem, uh, any network, an economic system, a neural net. And we start with some knowledge at the macroscopic scale of the values of what we could call state variables. Remember, in thermodynamics, state variables are quantities like pressure, volume, temperature. 
In ecology, state variables might be something like the area of the ecosystem, the number of species in it, the number of individuals, and the total metabolism of the system, the metabolic rate. In networks, the macro variables might be the total number of nodes and the total number of edges. In economics, the macro variables might be the, numbers of, the number of sectors, firms, nations, people, total productivity, and so on. Now, from the knowledge of those state variables, and in Bayesian language, I'm going to call those our priors, we want to infer the distributions, the probability distributions, at the micro scale. In the case of thermodynamics, for example, the kinetic energies of the molecules. What's the distribution of molecular speeds? In ecology, we might want to predict the distribution of the number of individuals over the species, or the distribution of the metabolic rates over all the individuals in the ecosystem, or the distribution of species and individuals over space. Those are things that might be outcomes of a theory of ecology. In networks, we might want to know the distribution of linkages across nodes or the distribution of flow rates across the linkages, the edges in a, in a network. Um, in economics, we might want to know the distribution of individual incomes or uh, the, in, the matrix data in an input-output table and so on. So the Maxent principle is a means of going from prior knowledge to uh, inferred probability distributions. And let me say a bit about how it works. The basic idea, first of all, is to um, first we have to understand by entropy in the maximum entropy, by entropy we don't mean thermodynamic entropy, we mean Shannon information entropy. Now there's a huge similarity both in the structure of Shannon information entropy and in Gibbs thermodynamic entropy, but they are conceptually different. And they're connected, they're related, but they're not identical. And we're talking about information entropy. The Shannon formula for information entropy is given in that summation. The information entropy I is a sum over N of P of N log P of N. It's a measure, really, not of information, but as the word information entropy suggests, it's a measure of ignorance. It's a measure of what we don't know after we know the probability distribution. So high entropy would correspond to smooth and flat distributions. If I tell you the probability distribution is uniform, flat and uniform uh, across some variable, you really don't know much. It means it could be anywhere. If I tell you the distribution is narrow and peaked at some place, then you know more and the entropy is lower. So those two distributions that I've shown, uh, the two P of Ns, uh, the one on the left has higher information entropy than the one on the right. They both both might be consistent with your prior knowledge. For example, suppose your prior knowledge is that you know a couple of the moments of the distribution. You know the average and maybe the, the variance in the distribution. And suppose both of those were compatible with your prior knowledge. What the Maxent principle says is pick the one on the left. Pick the one with the highest entropy. If there's one that's even flatter than that, pick it. And the reason is that if you have chosen a distribution that has lower entropy than the maximum entropy distribution, implicit in it is information you have no right to assume. Because both were consistent with all your prior knowledge. And so if you pick one that effectively makes more statements about what's likely or unlikely, you're, in effect, assuming information you have no right to assume. You're a biased. And so Ed Jaynes, who developed the Maxent concept, argued that to find the, make the least biased inference of the shape of a distribution that's consistent with all your prior knowledge of it, pick the distribution 
that matches your prior knowledge, but has the, the maximum possible information entropy. Um, and that's, that's basically all it is. And that principle is what um, was used by Ed Jaynes and many others to do things like derive all of statistical mechanics. It comes out of the Maxent principle. Now, it was derived earlier by other methods, um, but Gibbs implicitly was using the Maxent concept, and Jaynes did so explicitly. And it's led to um, a lot of very uh, powerful theory in physics. And what I want to do now is show you how we can build a theory of ecology around the maximum information entropy principle. So the theory I'm going to show you is called MET, M-E-T-E. It stands for the Maximum Entropy Theory of Ecology. And the goal of the theory is to predict patterns in ecology. And I've listed some of them, the five bulleted patterns, abundance and body size distributions, the correlation between body size and abundance, spatial clustering patterns and species area relationships, structure of taxonomic trees, and food web structure, and much more. Um, I'm not going to show you all of that today, but we'll get into some of it. Um, we want this theory to be broadly applicable. First of all, I do, across taxa. I don't want one theory for plants and another theory for arthropods. We want one unified theory that does it all. We don't want one theory that describes small patches on the landscape and yet a different theory for studying uh, biomes at multi-square kilometer scale. We don't want one theory for forests and another one for deserts. And we don't want one theory that will help us understand patterns involving species and a completely different theory for dealing with higher taxonomic categories. So it's, a, it's ambitious. And we, on top of all this, we want the theory to make predictions with no adjustable parameters. So we're starting out with a, with a tall order. And I'm going to try to show you that uh, we can achieve it. Um, how does the theory work? Well, first of all, there are two functions that are at the core of the theory. The one on the top left is R, R of N and E. It's, a, it's called the ecological structure function. And it's a joint conditional probability distribution describing the allocation of metabolism to individuals and individuals to species. Pictorially, you can think of it in that um, flow diagram on the lower left, where uh, metabolism, the total metabolism is E naught. That's the state variable. N naught is the total number of individuals, another state variable. And the third is the number of species, S naught. And we're allocating metabolism to individuals and individuals to species. Uh, interestingly, the word meat means to allocate. So it's an appropriate acronym. That's the that's one component of the theory. And we're going to use Maxent to derive its form. And the answer is shown in that upper left box. That's the result that Maxent gives for the behavior of the structure function if all you know is the state variables S, N, and E. The other function at the core of the theory is a spatial distribution, which we call pi. Um, and the way it's defined is best seen from this uh, picture. Suppose I have an area A naught, and in it is a species with N naught individuals. So I have A naught, N naught inside that box. Within that big area, A naught, let me carve out a small area, a few square meters maybe, or whatever, but a sub area within A naught. And I want to ask the question, if there are n naught individuals in A naught, what's the probability that there are n individuals in A? If you know how many are in the big area, what's the probability of finding n of those individuals in a small area? And the form for pi given by Maxent is shown at the, up at the upper right. Now, from those two distributions, pi and r, all of the patterns of macroecology flow. That's why they were chosen, because once we know them, we can derive 
all kinds of other um, interesting things that ecologists care about. Species area relationships, distributions of abundance over the species, distribution of metabolic rates over individuals, um, occupancy relationships in space, correlations between metabolism and abundance. Um, so this is just, you know, I don't expect you to follow everything on that slide, but it's to show you that from those two core functions that come immediately out of Maxent, there comes a flow of interesting predictions with no adjustable parameters because all the parameters you see in those functions are functions of the known measured state variables. So there's nothing to twiddle, no knobs on this theory. Now, I'm going to show you just a few of the many, many tests we've done. Uh, all together, we've looked at over 20 distinct habitats. We've looked at total of about 100, 000, actually a couple hundred thousand species. We've looked at about 10 to the 14th individuals total. Uh, that's a little bit hard to get your head around, but uh, remember there are 10 to the 14th microbes in each of your guts. Um, and there are about 10 to the 14th trees in the Amazon, interestingly. About as many trees in the Amazon as microbes inside each of you. Um, those are some of the habitats that we have data for listed on the left. And let's just look at one prediction. Uh, the, di the predicted uh, distribution of abundances across species. The prediction from Maxent is a function shown on the left. Um, it's called the Fisher log series distribution, named after R. Fisher, the statistician, who noted that this distribution nicely described the distribution of plant pathogens on agricultural crops when he was studying that. Um, uh, what we, I'm going to just show you one test because it's so comprehensive. It was carried out by Ethan White and his students uh, in 2012, and he was testing the validity of our prediction across almost 16,000 communities of plants or mammals or um, uh, arthropods or birds. Um, and plotted is a huge data dump of um, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of um, species. And it's log observed abundance on the vertical axis and log predicted abundance on the, y, on the x axis. And he found that that form that we predict does a much better job than about four other contenders that people have proposed for species abundance distributions. Um, what I want to do next is um, just show you two more interesting tests because they, are, they were the result of predictions that completely knocked our socks off. These were predictions that I call them oh crap predictions because when we made them, we said, oh gosh, we've just killed the theory because the prediction was so bizarre. It didn't seem like it could possibly be right. So let me show you what these two predictions are and uh, their um, tests of their validity. The first one has to do with the influence on macroecology of the structure of the taxonomic tree that the organisms are part of. A taxonomic tree tells us at the tips the species or it could be subspecies. And then uh, as you go up, away from the tip, up the branch, you get to the genus, the family, and so on. And as you work your way up, of course, you see interesting patterns. Some species are in families with very few species, and other species are in families with lots of species. And the thing that the theory predicted, to our surprise, was that at one of the patterns it predicts is strongly sensitive to the structure of that tree. And it was sensitive in a way that had never been thought about before. And so we were immediately assumed it was probably going to be wrong. Uh, here's the way it works. The theory, if you just include species as a state variable and you don't include families in higher taxonomic categories, then the theory makes a prediction that was greeted uh, positively by people, because people had a sense that this was a correct feature of nature. Namely, 
if you look at the relationship between the abundance of a species and the average size of an individual in it, it should be an inverse relationship. If you go to Africa, you'll see a few small number of elephants and you'll see a large number of ants. But the specific relationship that's predicted in the theory is that if I plot log abundance against log metabolic rate, I should see a slope of minus one. In other words, there's an inverse relationship between abundance and metabolic rate. If instead of plotting metabolic rate, I plotted body size of organisms, the slope should be minus three quarters because in ecology there's a, a rather accurate metabolic scaling law that says metabolism scales like body size to the three quarters power. <coughs> so uh, Pablo Marquette in 1990 published a paper in Science, which is one of the first tests of this idea that the um, inverse relationship between abundance and metabolic rate. He plotted mass or body size of individuals against the density of the number of individuals, in other words, abundance in an intertidal ecosystem. He was looking at invertebrates that inhabit the intertidal zone off the coast of Chile. And he found data with a lot of scatter, but with a slope of minus 0.73 which agrees with the minus three quarter prediction from metabolic scaling. In other words, this kind of confirms this idea that there's an inverse relationship between metabolism and abundance, but there's an enormous amount of scatter. And so the question is, can we understand the scatter? We predicted in the original Maxent theory where we didn't include higher order taxonomic categories. We only included numbers of species as a state variable. And we predicted from that theory that all the data should fall on a single straight line with a slope of minus one. When we calculated from the theory what the scatter should be, it was much less than the scatter in Pablo's data. Now, what we said is suppose we add a new state variable in addition to area, number of species, number of individuals, and total metabolic rate, suppose I add number of families. What happens is Maxent makes an unambiguous prediction that that single straight line predicted on the left side of the graph when you plot log n versus log size, the single line with a slope of minus 3 quarters, that line should split apart into multiple lines with each one corresponding to the species in families with the same numbers of species. In other words, some families might have only a few species and they should be down toward the origin on a straight, on a line with a slope of minus three quarters. Families with very few species should lie near, uh, far from the origin on the outer line. And what happens is we, we took, I'm not going to show you all the data, we took about eight data sets with very good size abundance relationships and found that most of the scatter was resolved by adding that state variable number of families. So um, that was kind of neat. But there was another benefit from the theory. Once we added the number of families, the theory immediately predicts the distribution of the number of species across families. And what it predicts is a function, actually, it's also the Fisher log series, although the meaning is different now, because it's a function of little m, the number of species per family. It's a probability distribution. If you pick a family at random, what's the probability it has m species in it? And we tested log predicted against log observed for a huge number of of types of data, uh, birds, arthropods, human gut uh, microbiome data, and so on. And we found excellent agreement between the prediction of the theory and um, the data. So taxonomy influences macroecology, a surprise, but it seems to work just the way the theory says it should work. The second surprise was more dramatic. Um, 
Ecologists um, love to talk about something called the species area relationship. If you go out and census the number of trees in a square kilometer of the Amazon, you might see typically something on the, on the order of several hundred species of trees. Now go sample twice as big an area. Well, you won't see twice as many species because there'll be a lot of overlap, but you'll see more. The bigger the area, the more species you'll see. As you go to bigger areas, you can plot the number of species as a function of area. And typically what people plot is the logarithm of the number of species against the logarithm of area. And that's shown in the upper left. And when you do that, you typically get a curve that is not a straight line. It's not a power law. It's got uh, some bend in it. And you can ask, what's the slope at any given point on that curve? We'll call that slope the tangent to the curve, z of a. Now, if I plot a whole lot of species area relationships all on one graph, I, go, I do it for forests, birds, insects, all kinds of critters, and I put them all on one graph. What I would essentially do is fill the graph with dots. There would be no rhyme nor reason, no pattern, no simplicity in such a graph. No universality. But when we looked at the prediction of our Maxent theory, it said, hey, don't plot it that way. If you want to see the beauty the universality in species area relationships do the following. On the vertical axis, plot that tangent slope, z of a, at any given area. Um, plot z on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, plot the following quantity. At that area, for that ecosystem, for that species area curve, at that area, there's some value for n, the number of individuals, and there's some other value for s, the number of species. Take the ratio, take the log of that ratio, and plot the slope against the log of that ratio. And the theory said all the data should collapse onto that uh, curved line, the solid line. Now, when we saw that prediction, we said, oh crap just killed our theory. There's no way all of the mess that results from species area relationships are going to fall on a single universal curve. But lo and behold, when we took data from dozens of species area, actually over 50 sites are shown here, and we plotted all the slopes from many, many sites. There are more than 50 dots because each species area curve has more than one slope because you can work your way up the whole curve. And when we did it, we found that although there's some scatter, everything does tend to follow the general pattern of the prediction. In contrast, a lot of people have argued, you know, there's some curvature in that log-log plot on the upper left, but let's not worry about curvature. Let's fit it with a straight line and call it a power law. And so the idea that species area relationships are a power law has taken hold in ecology. And a lot of people use that idea to uh, calculate things like how many species of microbes are there on the planet. Uh, you get bizarre numbers when you do it. And you can see why that would be a silly thing to assume. The typical power law assumption is that the power law slope is one quarter. So the number of species rises with area to the one quarter. If that were the case, all of those dots would lie on the dashed line, which corresponds to a constant slope of one quarter. And you can see it's not the way nature works. You can also see that as n over s gets large, the slope gets smaller and smaller. And that's interesting, because there's actually a data point way out here from Australia from a former student of mine, Jessica Green, who was a postdoc in Australia measured species area relationships for soil microbes. And she got slopes of about 0.03 for species area relationships at large distance. That is, she was working out on a, um, large areas and getting slopes and finding them to be very, very small. Now, 
uh, n over s for microbes is a huge number. Uh, the, the, as far as we know, they're on the order of tens of thousands of soil microbe species uh, in this location in Australia, and 10 to the 16th or 17th individuals. So the ratio is huge, and the logarithm is even huge, and you're out here somewhere where the predicted slope turns out to be about 0.03. So um, it seems to work over large scales. Now, all of this, everything I've said is suggests we have a theory of ecology. But, as always, uh, there's um, a fly in the ointment. And the fly in the ointment is disturbance. We have done all those tests I showed you on ecosystems that are what I would call quasi-static. They're not rapidly changing from year to year. But we had a suspicion that in systems that were changing rapidly, we would start to see divergences from theory. So Erica Newman, who is a uh, recently finished PhD student of mine, did part of her dissertation research out at Point Reyes National Seashore. And she measured species area curves for two bishop pine forest plots. Bishop pine is the dominant species of pine out at Point Reyes, and she worked at one site Mount Vision, where there has, as far as we know, been no fires for at least the last 100 years. So it's a mature bishop pine forest. And she measured in plots that were um, 64 uh, square meters. I'm sorry, 256 square meters. She measured the species area relationship by looking at small squares and then bigger squares, nested bigger and bigger squares within the plot and plotted her data to compare with the universally predicted species area curve and found very good agreement. Then she went about uh, two kilometers away to a site that had burned, severely burned, in the 1990s. The if any of you were around here then, the, big, the famous Inverness fire that burned the uh, hills above uh, the town of Inverness and Point Reyes. And at that site now, it's 25 years after the fire, what's happening is plants are coming back. There are little bishop pine trees about this big. There's poison oak and lots of interesting understory. And she measured the species area relationship and found the results on the left uh, very um, distinctly different from the prediction. So that suggests that under disturbance, our theory doesn't work. More examples. Um, there's a plot in Panama, the Barrow, Colorado Island 50 hectare plot. And people have taken this as sort of a Rosetta Stone for macroecology. But there's a problem with that site. It's losing species. It's going downhill. And the reason is Barrow, Colorado Island didn't used to be an island. It was contiguous with mainland Panamanian forest. But when they created the Panama Canal, they created Lake Gatun. And Barrow, Colorado Island was a mountain, a hilltop in what is now Lake Gatun. So it isolated, the lake isolated the um, Barrow, Colorado Island from the mainland. It used to be contiguous. And so that means that a source of immigrants from the surrounding forest has been cut off. And that is why folks um, like Egbert Lee and, and uh, Barrow, Colorado Island Field Station think the uh, sp system is going downhill. It's losing species uh, year after year. And um, the species abundance distribution deviates from the Maxent prediction by that little bulge you see there. It may not look like a big deal, the prediction is the, the slightly um, nervous looking straight line uh, with the hockey stick shape to it. And the data follow the hockey stick blade at the left at high abundance, but they deviate from the straight line prediction uh, at intermediate uh, abundance. The plot is the logarithm of abundance against the rank order of the species, rank ordered by abundance. And so that may or may not look like a big deal, but we think it is. 
And one of the goals would be, of course, to understand that and to understand species area deviations like the one shown on the left. Uh, there are many other examples that we've now accumulated of disturbed, rapidly changing ecosystems deviating from theory. Um, plant diversity in the highly fragmented uh, United Kingdom, a paper by Coonan et al. Uh, moths at Rough Hampstead in England on newly fallowed fields follow a log normal abundance distribution instead of the predicted log series distribution. Arthropods on Hawaiian islands of differing ages, work done by Andy Rominger, a former student of mine and Rosie's, uh, did some beautiful work on this and showed deviations from theory on uh, islands where we think change is more rapid. Uh, there's work at an uh, experimental site in the southwest desert at Portal by Sarah Soup and others showing that rodent population abundance distributions shift from a log series to something more like a log normal when you put enclosures around a system and prevent free movement of rodents on large spatial scales. So all of this suggests we need a new, more dynamic theory. And we're calling the theory dynamite. We don't have it in hand yet, but we have some ideas about what we think it could look like. So it would be a theory of dynamic macroecology that predicts the changing shapes of patterns under disturbance. And the disturbance could either be anthropogenic or it could be natural succession. Ecosystems, in some cases, are naturally changing, like on Hawaiian islands, where newly formed islands come out of the sea as just lava and they're bare, and then soil builds up and plant, de plant communities develop and things change naturally over time. So what might such a theory look like? I'm going to just show you a, um, an example of something we're pursuing, and it may or may not be the final word. Um, Dynamite, uh, we envision it as a hybrid theory. It will have a mechanistic parent, which meat did not have. Meat was purely statistical. It was just based on information entropy and principles that don't involve particular mechanisms. And it will have an information theoretic parent. And the hybrid is going to look maybe something like the following. The mechanistic parent is going to involve whatever the mechanisms are that actually drive change. Change is unique. Every system is changing differently. It's like Tolstoy's adage about families. Every happy family is the same. Every unhappy family is unique. And the happy families are the undisturbed ecosystems. And statistics works. The unhappy families are the disturbed systems, and they're all different because there are so many different ways to disturb an ecosystem. Um, if you call uh, in that expression on the, the equation on the upper left, uh, W is a state variable, like number of species or total metabolic rate. And initially, there's going to be a time zero, a disturbance occurs. And at that point in time, the rate of change of the state variables can be derived by knowing the mechanisms at the micro scale that cause disturbance and scaling them up with the time zero structure function, which is still the structure function given by Max Ent in the static theory. From the rates of changes of the state variables, we can drive the change in the structure function. So on the right, we take that rate of change of W and we plug it into that equation and drive this change in the structure function. From the change in the structure function, we get the change of the structure function at the next time interval t equals 1. And then we can scale up from q to the rate of change of the state variables at t equals 1. And we can keep going back and forth and go do this over longer and longer time periods. So that's the approach we're now looking at. And um, uh, Kaito Humamura and Micah Brush, who are working with me on this, and I are all busy exploring what uh, this approach might yield. Um, I'm not going to, we have some tentative results, but we're not sure we believe them. And so I don't want to show you those yet. But 
um, I think we're sort of close to uh, having a dynamic theory in hand. Um, I want to just back up for a second with a very general uh, slide. Why does meat work? This, why does the static theory work? And I think one of the ways of thinking about this is that there are so many governing mechanisms in ecology that you don't have to worry about them. If you think about all the species in an ecosystem as sitting around the fitness table, and they all have a place at the table. They're all somehow in a balance with each other through very different means. One of them may be very good at running away from its prey. Another one might be very good at camouflage. Another one might be very good at um, uh, finding, um, uh, you know, living off detritus or whatever. They're all, they all have different traits and different mechanisms that allow them to all coexist. Now, that I think is why a statistical approach can work. Uh, under disturbance, what happens is somebody's lifting one end of the table, some of the species go tumbling off, others may have ascendancy under that change, and the statistical approach doesn't work anymore. Um, so that's just sort of a hand-wavy way of thinking about why statistics might work in ecology. Um, I'm going to just show you this, but not go into it in detail. There are many things we can do with this theory that are relevant in conservation biology. Um, resolving existing debates, figuring out how many species of beetles there are in the Amazon, uh, predicting species loss under climate change or habitat loss, and so on. To summarize, the maximum entropy theory of ecology provides remarkably accurate predictions for the static shapes of numerous patterns observed in steady state ecosystems. But the predictions fail in rapidly changing systems. A dynamic extension of meat offers a possible approach to describing disturbed, rapidly changing ecosystems. And I want to conclude with something that is an, totally a generalization and, prob and not totally defensible, but I'll say it anyway. I'm of the opinion, after working on this stuff for 10 years, that the maximum information entropy method is an extraordinarily powerful, sturdy foundation for the construction of complex systems theory. And I want to leave you with the uh, suggestion that many possible additional applications could be carried out, applications in economics, linguistics, protein folding, neural net behavior and many other data-rich systems. Uh, people are beginning to apply these ideas in economics, uh, and ex developing more powerful economic theory based on it. And um, there are some very interesting applications in neural net uh, uh, dynamics um, carried out by Bialik's group at Princeton. Um, and I think that uh, we're just at the threshold of um, uh, seen the more and more widespread use of this idea of the maximum information entropy concept to gain a deeper predictive understanding of complex systems behavior. And I want to thank many, many people who have worked with me on this over the years, uh, funders and hosts who have provided amazing locations in which to work. Um, and uh, with that, um, I'll take questions.